we finished that this morning. So we began last week by looking at the rejection of Moses. And then this week we started with the rejection of God, verse 40 of chapter six, chapter seven of the book of Acts. And the rejection of Moses and the rejection of God led ultimately to the, to the fact that the nation fell into idol worship. Now this is Stephen's point in verses 41 through verse 42. Particularly, he focused on the, the golden calf incident. And in the golden calf incident, not only did they make a golden calf, but then we began looking at <clears throat> God's response. He turned them over and he delivered them up. And we looked at what these, these ideas meant. And then we concluded with God's response proven. And the reason, I, the reason that this last part was so important, the response, the God's response, excuse me, uh, yeah, God's response proven was so important was because when you read the book of Exodus, you don't get the picture of what Stephen's talking about. So it'd be easy to conclude that Stephen is making this up or maybe he receives divine revelation that, that nobody had or something like that. And neither, neither of those is the case. Stephen didn't make it up nor did he have divine revelation given to him, particularly Stephen was basing his comments on the book of Amos. In the, in the prophet Amos, Amos, really well God through Amos, <laughs> discussed the fact that the Exodus generation was idolatrous. Now we knew about the golden calf, but Amos, God and Amos reveal some other things about, about the, 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 uh, the nation uh, during the, that time of their existence. Uh, God said they worshiped the host of heaven. Uh, they were worshiping all type of gods uh, during the Exodus. You, you don't get that picture in the book of Exodus, but clearly God knew the hearts of the people and knew that they were turned away from him. And so Amos, tell, uh, God tells of this. And what that means is that the incident, the, the golden calf incident becomes a type, a type, a type of representing the nation's disobedience. It becomes a type. And so God in Amos says Amos's generation is just like the Exodus generation. And then Stephen is gonna say that his generation is just like them. So the Exodus generation begins a long line of rebellion in the nation of Israel that, is, that concludes with the rebellion in Jesus' day and age when the religious leaders killed him, will eventually kill him. And so the Exodus generation is a type and Stephen uses them as a type. And why this is so powerful in Stephen's message is because Stephen appeals to the Jewish scriptures to demonstrate Jewish apostasy. So what are the leadership, what's the leadership gonna say? How, how, how are they gonna defend themselves against Stephen's charge when the very Bible that they use argues for their rebellion? Well, they can't fight against Stephen, they're gonna ultimately kill him. Uh, but but Stephen, Stephen is painting them into a corner using their own Bible. That's, that's the extraordinary thing. And so Stephen, uh, finishes his, his, uh, his demonstration that they fell into idol worship. We continued from there this morning and looked at the, uh, Stephen's look at the sanctuary. Uh, Stephen, uh, as you know, from Acts chapter six, one of the charges against Stephen was he spoke against the, the, uh, the temple. That was one of the charges that the other Jews brought up against him that led to his trial. He spoke he spoke against the, 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 uh, the holy place and indicated that the holy place was gonna be destroyed. And so that was blasphemy to them. I mean, to say those things about the holy place was blasphemy. Now, 
did Stephen say those things exactly? Was this made up and, and a lie? There's some debate over those things, but clearly Stephen takes up the issue of the sanctuary and defends himself. And he begins by showing that he understood very well what the sanctuary was. I mean, when you look at verses 45 and, and 40, 44 and 45, Stephen is a, is a classical Jew when it comes to the sanctuary. He knew where it came from. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a human building. Moses saw it in heaven and he replicated it on earth and the, the children of Israel fought behind it and they dispossessed all of the other nations from the promised land. Joshua went in and we see, the, uh, we see that Stephen knew very well the history of, of the sanctuary and its importance. So, so the idea that Stephen was somehow negative towards the sanctuary is just not true. But then Stephen turned to the Davidic era, and what did, he, what did he say there? He said that David wanted to build a house for God, and God didn't allow him to build it. He let, he let, he let Solomon build it. But notice what Stephen says. This supposed house, it can't hold God. That was Stephen's point. It can't hold God. God is bigger than the house. So the, the Israelite focus on the temple was misplaced. Even if the temple wasn't there, that wasn't God's house anyway. God, God can't be confined to a building as the Jews were, were attempting to do, confine them to a building. And so we see that they misunderstood what the temple was all about. And that was verses 46 through verse 50. We then move to the application of Stephen's thoughts. This is verses 51 through 53, where Stephen applies, applies some of what he had been saying. Now, this morning I kind of presented to you that Stephen didn't finish his application. I mean, in this application, you can see that Stephen is beginning to, to turn the corner and speak about Jesus. So <laughs> Stephen is probably, maybe, what, maybe halfway through his sermon? I mean, he, 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 hadn't even, he, haven't, he hasn't even cranked up his discussion on, on Jesus yet. He, he just starts talking about Jesus in verses 51 to 53, and they lose their minds. All right, so, so he never really gets to finish his thought. But three things that he tells them that they were that drove them over the top. They were resistors against God, they were murderers of the Messiah, and they were rebels against the law. And uh, this, of course, was how he concluded verses 51 through 53. And as I said, this really pushed them over the top. When they heard those things, they lost it. And they ended up killing Stephen, which we'll look at next week. Any questions on the morning's message? Yes, go ahead. shocked me when I began to look at this, this passage because I was the same, I was, Ken, what, what I thought about was, I thought they were making sacrifices to God all, all this time. That's, that really was what my perspective was. But God says in Amos, for 40 years in the wilderness, they weren't, they weren't offering sacrifices to me. Now he's not talking about well, the time that they're in Egypt because they didn't have a chance to sacrifice to them, but it's when they escaped yeah. Egypt, they're, they're still disobedient. Yeah, one of, one of the, I didn't make this statement this morning, but I, I had this line I was going to say this morning, which was, um, it's no wonder these people died in the wilderness. I mean, they, they were, they were not worshiping God. I mean, in Amos, God is pretty clear. 
uh, I, I, you'd be hard pressed to get around his statement that, and, and, and again, when, when you read, as I said this morning, when you read Exodus, you don't get the whole picture because as you, as you know, in Exodus, God says, hey, Moses, go on down to Europe. The people you brought out have broken the covenant. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to wipe them out and start a brand new nation with you. And Moses prays. He stops God's hand. God's not going to do that after all. And, uh, you know, he gives them the, uh, Moses writes out an, another copy of, of the covenant. God judges them partially. He doesn't wipe them all out, wipes out some of them. And they go on. And that was kind of my take on it. But, um, yeah, Stephen is pretty clear in his argument. These folk were never right. And, and Amos, Amos tells us that they never got right. There was something, there was something wrong with them in the wilderness. And that becomes a type, a type, as I said earlier, for Israelite disobedience. That, that's, that's kind of the classic picture of their disobedience. And God kind of uses that, and Stephen uses it, to show that this is what you all do. So is it that, because you made a statement about them, and you compare it to us today, they're holding on to Egypt. Egypt. Mm -hmm. And them holding on to Egypt, is, is that a reason why they're not, I guess, not sacrificing or what have you? Yeah, I mean, when you, when you, um, <laughs> so, so when you, so when you look at, when you look at them, I don't know if you remember, but in the morning's message, I said, okay, so it's translated God in Exodus, make us a God. Aaron makes them one God. And then, and then encourages them to make offerings to Yahweh. That's the true God. So he makes this idol, but he, but he really wants them to focus on Yahweh. But then Stephen says, gods, plural. They made gods. They said, make us gods. Well, th that kind of shows you the emphasis. Where did the, where did the polytheism come from? Well, the, only place, the only place you can argue that it came from was, was Egypt. I mean... They were monotheistic from the time of Abraham onward. And so they couldn't have got it from their ancestry because Abraham left and he worshiped the true God as, as did every, every member of the family after that point. And once they get the law, again, they're, polythe they're uh, monotheistic because that's what's in the law. So the only place they could have attracted the polytheism was, was in Egypt. And so, yeah, I argued that, you know, Egypt was still clinging to them and encouraged us to examine whether the world is clinging to us, you know, and, and uh, how, how, we, how we operate in the world. As Christians, uh, do we operate as aliens and strangers to the world, or are we, are we a part of it? Uh, this has a lot, of, a lot of implications for a lot of different things about our, our modern world and how Christians, how Christians interact with, their, with the modern world, you know. Do we operate as if we're part of it, or do we operate beyond it? And that's a pretty, pretty heavy question. Go ahead. So, um, question. So Egypt makes sense in a lot of ways, the, getting the idea of... Um, um, multiple gods but what about when they got into the promised land i mean i know it's, it's not technical what steve was talking about but well but in the promised land there were a lot of a lot of polytheism as well you think oh yeah huge huge amount yeah i was thinking they've gotten a lot of it from there as well i mean just maybe just reinforce i mean you could have a whole new generation because the old generation had died in the wilderness before they got to the promised land, but it seemed like they had similar issue in the promised land too. Yeah, I mean, polytheism <clears throat> plagued, plagued Israel throughout its, 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 uh, its history. Right now I'm reading through the Old Testament again, and uh, so I'm in, I'm in Jeremiah. And, you know, <laughs> when you read the prophets, I mean, I just finished Isaiah, I'm in Jeremiah now, all they're complaining about is polytheism. I mean, you know, under every rock, under every tree, I mean, there's, there's an altar everywhere. You know, God is just, 
God is upset at, 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 at the nation for their polytheism. But yeah, they, they, they never, they picked it up again. And, and you know, Stephen, Stephen skipped over a lot of information. I mean, he didn't even deal with the judges. I mean, he, he went straight from Joshua getting in the promised land to King David. Well, he left out a whole chunk there. Uh, he, he, could have, he could have talked about that as an illustration of what the nation did. I mean, it, they slip into polytheism very, very easily, and, and it, it, becomes a, it becomes a constant, a constant um, temptation, I guess, uh, is the best word for it, that the, that the people always, always had. And it's, it's, something, it's something that, you know, I, I, I don't think that the church is polytheistic by any means. But, uh, you know, we, we, have, we have sinful tendencies too as a, as, a, as, a, as a corporate body that can be problematic and that we have to fight against. Uh, Israel didn't do a good job of fighting against it. And, and of course, they were a mixed multitude. Not, not, not everybody in Israel was saved, of course, uh, as is true of the visible church. Now, the invisible church, of course, all the invisible church is saved, but the, the physical manifestation of the church has, its, has its, its ongoing challenges. Some of them they meet well, and some of them they don't meet very well. Go ahead. So, with respect to um, going back to Egypt at this point, you know, when God called Moses to go to deliver them, I mean, he said, I'm trying to go from memory here, that he heard their cry, basically, he was going to deliver them. I'm wondering if, I mean, I guess with any even modern church, you think of Israel as well, there's always going to be the, the true believers and then those aren't true. But one thing that I, I'm thinking about now is this, did God send Moses because of, they were, they were genuinely crying out to the Lord um, or Yahweh or simply because in his sovereignty he knew, okay, I'm going to let him stay in, his, in Egypt for X time. The time is now, so regardless of what their spiritual condition were, I'm going to deliver them regardless. What do you think? Of, That's a good that? question. I mean, uh, obviously based on Genesis 15, God had told Abraham they were, going to be in the, they were going to be in the land where they were going to be slaves for 400 years. So that was, that was part of God's sovereign plan. Now you're asking, who were they really crying out to? Were they crying out to, uh, were they crying out to God or were they crying out just in general? I mean, um, when, you, when, you look at, uh, when you look at Exodus chapter three, you get the idea that there, they're crying out. Uh, it seems that they may be crying out to God, um, the God of their fathers. Um, but 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 was that was that a um, national reality? I mean, was everybody doing that? Probably not. Probably not. But they were. They had definitely reached a point of uh, where the nation existence was going to was being called into question. I mean, when you think of what Pharaoh was doing, kill, trying to kill the boys, uh, you know that their, their existence as a, as a nation was was going to was going to be called into question there. And so God moves to safeguard them, as He promised He would. Uh, some of the, the the background to it, though, we we really can't say authoritatively one way or the other. Any other questions? <clears throat> it seems kind of easy to, when you look at Egypt, look at the Israelites and the golden calf, you can say, all right, that's other gods that you, you're trusting in, but I want to believe. But today, it just seems like we don't think of, it doesn't seem to be that clear cut. You know, we can have these business pursuits. We can, it can be materialism or, or whatever, and you don't, technically look at that as idolatry or, or worshiping idols, but if you're pursuing, you have more of a passion for those things than Christ, that thing may be just as bad an idol as, you know, the golden calf. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Ken. Uh, you know, one of the things that um, <clears throat> in Colossians chapter 3, and this just proves, this just is, I'm going to say this to, to prove your point. Uh, in Colossians chapter 3, Paul uh, talks about, he lists, he gives a group of sins. And one of the sins he gives is greed. And then he, then he says, which amounts to idolatry. So he, he calls greed idolatry. We don't necessarily think in that way. I mean, we know greed is bad, but we wouldn't think of it as an idol. But Paul thought about it as an idol. And so, yeah, we, we, uh, on, based on ideas like that in the Bible, we, we probably need to have a broader definition of idolatry than just a physical idol that you, you bow down to and offer sacrifices to. Uh, there, is an, uh, there is idolatry that is not that clear cut uh, from the, from a, from an, you know, you see it idea. It's, it's more of a, an idol of the heart, uh, of, of your uh, daily pursuits, uh, uh, you know, what are your ambitions about, th th those type of things. Yeah, but I, I would agree with you on that. Yeah.